Hi everybody, it's Mr. Matthew here for Honors Biology Unit 2, Theme 5. In this video, we're going to talk about how living things are primarily composed of four macromolecules. And so for this, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the difference between an organic and an inorganic molecule. I'll also talk about the properties of hydrophobic and hydrophilic molecules. Uh, I'll then get into the four major macromolecule structure, function, and a little bit about calorie content, although that's mostly in a different video, so I'll show the link for that. I will also then talk a little bit about some examples that your textbook highlights, and then uh, we'll talk about enzymes. First, what are they? And then how do they uh, lead to specific types of reactions? So uh, let's start talking about the difference between organic and inorganic molecules. So our simple definition of organic is uh, these are molecules predominantly made up of carbons uh, and often with hydrocarbon components. So we can look at these top three um, uh, examples here where we have a carbon with four links. We can see how that's turned into a chain of uh, carbons. This is like a butane, for example, with these four carbons in a chain, and this is an organic molecule. And then we can also see a ring of carbon atoms like we would see in certain other organic molecules. We'll see ring structures. Um, I know that when we model glucose, you'll see it as a ring, which is made up of carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens. So those are organic molecules. We contrast those with inorganic organic molecules, which are down on the bottom, which again, lack uh, that central carbon. So for example, we have this silica on the very bottom, which is uh, silicon and some oxygen molecules. We also see ammonia here, uh, where we have nitrogen and it's bound to some hydrogens. And so those are inorganic molecules lacking that carbon hydrogen. There are a couple of exceptions that I think are noteworthy, particularly for biology. The carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide, which I've put here in the middle, are actually carbon-based molecules, but they are considered inorganic. So, uh, and without going into huge amounts of details, just to be aware that technically speaking, these are generally classified as inorganic molecules. Uh, they are not key components of, of living systems or building blocks that we're going to use as subunits of larger structures. And so when we talk about, for example, photosynthesis, where we take carbon dioxide and water and we make a glucose, that is literally taking inorganic molecules and making an organic molecule from them. So I know that sometimes people come across uh, carbon dioxide in particular in readings and are a little confused. So I do want to make that note that not every carbon compound is organic, but anytime that you see like carbon hydrocarbons or uh, particularly hydrocarbons that have oxygens bound to them, those are usually going to be organic molecules. Specifically, we're going to look at four major types. Um, so we'll get to those in just a minute. So another key term to note uh, before we get into talking about the macromolecules is the terms hydrophilic and hydrophobic. So hydrophilic literally means, hydro means water, and philic refers to love. And so these are water-loving molecules. And hydrophobic are technically afraid of water or water-fearing molecules. And so what is, why do we talk about this? Well, when we get into the organic molecules that we're going to talk about, whether that is... Uh, uh, lipids, or whether we're talking about proteins, it's important to note that uh, there are different things that like to interact with water, certain molecules that interact with water. And these are really important because most of our cells are filled with a watery solution, sometimes called an aqueous solution. And most of the chemical reactions that take place within our body take place in these aqueous environments. That's not to say that there aren't uh, hydrophobic environments, but when we see these non these hydrophobic environments, those are slightly different and slightly special, um, and so these are terms. So, for example, we usually talk about this diagram over here, where we can see a, a series of lipids surrounded by water, and in these lipids, we have these hydrophilic heads. These are water-loving heads. These are the phosphates and the phospholipids. Uh, in here. And then we have hydrophobic tails, and hydrophobic tails arrange themselves so they're away from the water molecules that are in the environment. This is very much how lipid membranes form or lipid um, uh, vesicles form, and they'll form bilayers. In this leaf here, we can see water droplets beating up on top of the surface of the leaf, and that's because uh, the cuticle of a leaf is uh, made up of a waxy substance, and waxes are hydrophobic, which prevents the water from making those adhesion type interactions that we typically think of water making and so therefore the water beads up and can only interact with itself. So 
These two terms are really important. Another uh, categorization that we'll often uh, refer to these is that hydrophilic molecules um, are frequently charged or partially charged or polar. So you, if you hear the word polar molecules, like we talked about with water, polar molecules are t tend to be hydrophilic and non-polar um, molecules tend to be hydrophobic. So if you have something that lacks a charge and doesn't even have a partial charge, water has a hard time um, orienting around it and those are generally considered hydrophobic. Um, just a little uh, cue, and this will make a little bit more sense as we look at the different parts of molecules, and specifically when we get into cells and the parts of cells and how those are made up. All right, so uh, just generally speaking, there are four major macromolecules, um, and those macromolecules are composed of building blocks. So when we look at the top here, we see several different building blocks. We see amino acids, we see fatty acids, uh, we see carbohydrates, which probably most appropriately should be called a monosaccharide. And then we see nucleobases. Um, and so nucleobases, again, are going to make up nucleotides. And for each of these monomers, we're going to see that they are, can combine together to form polymers. So amino acids build up proteins, fatty acids and glycerols will make up phospholipids, uh, carbohydrates can bind together to form polysaccharides, and then uh, nucleo, uh, nucleobases can combine to make nucleotides, which then build up to form either DNA or RNA, our nucleic acids. And so the green boxes represent our four major macromolecules, and then there are subunits that build them up. Um, there's a video here in which I go into each of of these in much, much more detail, and that's going to be the other assigned uh, video uh, for this section. So I'll put the link here, or you can just go in and take a look within the either playlist or um, on the homework sheet to get that link. So uh, what am I talking about when I look at examples of these various things? So uh, oftentimes when we think about carbohydrates, we think of things like breads and pastas, um, sugars. Uh, these typically are things that fit into the carbohydrate realm. Uh, when we think of fats, what are we thinking about? We think of things like olive oil, avocado. Uh, olives obviously have a lot of lipids in them. That's why you can press them and get olive oil. Fish uh, tends to be rich in both protein and in fat. So a lot of times you'll hear about fish oils because fishes tend to have very uh, high amounts of lipids. Meat, particularly red meat, tends to have a high amount. Eggs and nuts also have a high amount of fat content in them, uh, which is associated with lipids. Um, over here next we see proteins. And again, several of the things that we saw, foods that we saw that have High lipid content frequently also have high protein content. So we have chicken breast here. Uh, we see nuts. These look like uh, beans or lentils that we have here and eggs. These are also uh, very rich in protein. As sort of you could see before, the seeds and the eggs and certain types of meat also have high amounts of lipid. And then the last grouping that we have over there are our nucleic acids. And our nucleic acids uh, are basically DNA and RNA. And those are the two major types of nucleic acids that we will talk about. All right, this leads us into the concept of enzymes. So what is an enzyme and what does it do? So enzymes are a type of protein. So looking back at our previous slide, that's the type of macromolecule that's protein. And it interacts, an enzyme interacts with a substrate um, and it causes a chemical reaction. So enzymes can take a single molecule and break it down into multiple uh subunits. Uh, it could take multiple subunits and put them together to build a larger molecule. It can convert something from one form to another. But what we end up seeing here is that um, the enzymes uh, will convert a substance. In this case, we see this sort of bluish um, oval and we turn it into this reddish structure in the bottom. Um, and the enzyme is not used up through this reaction. And so the enzyme can then recycle back and then be used again. Now, what does the enzyme do or how does the enzyme accomplish this? Uh, the enzyme will have a location known as the active site, which is going to be uh, chemically uh, favorable for this particular substrate so that the substrate will fit nicely into that active site. And then the enzyme will um, put pressure on, will apply a chemical um, intermolecular force on this and cause an alteration of the shape of that substrate in, or, in order to form it into a product. The reaction of turning the substrate into the product 
could be done without an enzyme. But if I was going to, I would have to apply a higher amount of energy um, in order to get that to take place. And so by having the enzyme, we uh, use what's known as a catalyst, a biological catalyst, which is the enzyme, which will lower the amount of activation energy needed to get that reaction to take place. So when we take a look at um, enzymes, what we find is that enzymes are very substrate specific. So what we'll find is those active sites have particular shapes, and it's not that any molecule can fit in there. It's not like a universal um, active site. The active sites are going to have specific shapes, and only certain types of molecules will be able to fit into those spots. And so, for example, in this case, we have this bright green molecule, and it's trying to fit in. It fits into the active site breaks that um, substance from one molecule down into two separate products. And then again, that enzyme can cycle back around and be reused. But we're not going to be able to take any old shape and fit it into here. So if I had some other random shape, you'll see that this doesn't fit in to the active site. And so therefore, no chemical reaction is going to take place with just any old shape. Uh, it's got to be something that's very specific to this enzyme. All right, so make sure you check out the other video um, about macromolecules uh, for this section, and um, I hope this was helpful.